When the first frost arrived on the northern plains, most people think survival meant huddling around a fire, hoping to make it through till spring. They're wrong. The Native Americans who lived here didn't just endure winter. They built an entire world beneath the Earth's surface. A network of homes, storage systems, and heating chambers that turned the ground itself into their greatest ally. While temperatures dropped to 40 below zero, families sat warm inside Earth lodges. While food grew scarce across frozen landscapes, cash pits preserved harvests for months. While other shelters crumbled under snow and wind, underground dwellings stood firm. This is the story of how Native Americans engineered survival, not with what they fought against, but with what they worked with, the earth. Why winter was deadly. Let's be clear about what winter meant on the Great Plains and in the northern woodlands. We're talking about regions where temperatures could plunge to 60 degrees below zero with the wind chill, where blizzards lasted for days, where the ground froze solid for five, sometimes six months straight. The bison herds migrated south or scattered, rivers locked under three feet of ice. The plants that sustained people through summer and fall disappeared under snow drifts taller than a person. For tribes across these regions, the Mandan along the Missouri River, the Hidatsa and Arikara on the northern plains, the Haudenosaunee in what's now New York, winter wasn't just uncomfortable. It was the ultimate test. These tribes didn't see winter as something to survive. They saw it as something to prepare for. The difference matters because preparation meant innovation. It meant building structures that could maintain 60 degree temperature differences between inside and outside. It meant developing food storage that could last eight months without refrigeration. The question they asked wasn't, how do we survive winter? It was, how do we make winter survivable? And the answer was underground. The Earth Lodge system, the Mandan, Hidatsa and Arikara tribes built villages of earth lodges along the Missouri River. Each lodge was a dome-shaped home, 30 to 60 feet in diameter, large enough to house multiple families. But here's what made them brilliant. They were semi-subterranean. The builders would excavate a pit about 12 to 24 inches deep. Then they'd set massive cottonwood posts in the ground, forming an inner square of tall columns and an outer ring of shorter posts. The women, who owned and built these homes, would create a framework of smaller saplings and reeds laid across timber crossbeams. Then came the insulation. Six to eight inches of earth packed against this framework, then a layer of willow branches, then dried grasses, then more earth. Finally, sections of sod creating walls sometimes three feet thick. At the center of the floor sat a fire pit. Directly above it, a smoke hole in the roof, carefully positioned and often covered with a bull boat, a round boat made from bison hide during heavy rain or snow. The entrance featured an extended vestibule, at least six to nine feet long. Inside that entrance, a windbreak. This blocked cold air from pouring directly into the living space. Now here's the part that matters. The earth itself acted as a thermal battery. During winter, the thick earth walls stored warmth from the fire and released it gradually. The partially underground construction meant the floor sat in contact with earth that never froze at that depth, providing a stable temperature base. When Lewis and Clark spent the winter of 1804 to 1805 with the Mandan, they marveled at how warm the lodges stayed. Outside, the Missouri River froze solid. Inside the earth lodges, families sat comfortably. That's engineering, underground food storage systems. Building a warm shelter solves one problem, but winter lasts months and you can't hunt when blizzards rage for days. The solution, cash pits, Carefully engineered storage chambers used from the Great Lakes through the plains and into the woodlands. A typical cash pit was bell-shaped. The opening at ground level might be only two to three feet across. But below ground, the pit expanded to seven feet wide and six feet deep. The shape mattered. That narrow neck prevented animals from accessing the contents. The wider bottom provided maximum storage capacity and the overall design created stable temperature and humidity conditions. 
Construction required knowledge. You had to find well-drained, sandy soil on high ground. Then you lined the entire interior with materials that created a moisture barrier, clay plaster, birch bark, grass mats, or woven reed coverings. What went into these pits? Dried corn, beans, squash, acorns, walnuts, hazelnuts, wild rice, dried berries, choke cherries, blueberries, cranberries. When it came time to seal a cash pit, the process was deliberate. Fill it with your dried goods. Cover the narrow opening with a flat stone or wooden plank. Pile earth over the top. Sometimes plant grass on it so the pit blended into the landscape. These pits functioned like root cellars. The surrounding earth maintained a stable cool temperature, usually between 40 and 50 degrees, cold enough to inhibit spoilage but not cold enough to freeze most foods. Archaeological excavations have found cash pits that still contained recognizable food remains hundreds of years later. In Michigan, researchers discovered 350 surface depressions at a single site, with cash pits dating back to the 1400s. This system turned seasonal abundance into year-round security. If you're finding this engineering fascinating, hit that subscribe button. We cover ancient innovations like this every week on Ancient Horizons. The Longhouse Heating Mystery. Move east to the forests of what's now New York, and you find a completely different architectural solution. The Haudenosaunee built longhouses that sometimes stretched over 200 feet long. These weren't just big homes. They were communal living systems designed for thermal efficiency. Construction started with a framework using hundreds of saplings driven into the ground. These poles bent toward each other at the top, creating an arched roof. Then the whole thing got covered with large sheets of elm bark, multiple layers acting as shingles. The result was a tunnel-like structure, about 20 to 25 feet wide and anywhere from 40 feet to several hundred feet long. Inside, the longhouse divided into compartments along both sides of a central corridor. Each compartment housed a nuclear family. But here's the heating innovation. Multiple fires ran down that central aisle. The typical pattern was one fire for every two families. So in a longhouse holding 20 families, you might have 10 fires spaced about 20 feet apart. Each fire had its own smoke hole directly above it, carefully designed with bark or hide flaps that adjusted based on wind direction. But the real trick was the draft system. The doors at each end could be adjusted to control airflow. Air flowed in, traveled along the floor where it was coldest, got heated by the fires, rose up, and exited through the smoke holes. This created a convection current that continuously circulated warm air through the entire structure. In winter, families slept on raised platforms along the walls, about four feet high, where the warmest air collected. Tests on reconstructed longhouses show interior temperatures staying 20 to 30 degrees warmer than outside. And here's something often overlooked. The communal structure itself was a heating strategy. 20 families meant 20 sets of bodies generating heat. Shared walls meant shared warmth. Subterranean pit houses of the southwest. Go south and west to the high desert of the Four Corners region. Different climate, similar solution. The ancestral Puebloans dealt with extreme temperature swings. Summer days over 100 degrees. Winter nights below zero. Their answer, pit houses and kivas, semi-subterranean chambers that use the Earth's thermal mass to moderate both extremes. Early pit houses were relatively simple. Excavate a circular pit 3 to 4 feet deep and 12 to 20 feet in diameter. Build a wooden frame over it using bent saplings. Cover the frame with layers of brush, grass, and earth. The genius was in going underground. At 3 to 4 feet deep, the surrounding earth maintains a constant temperature year-round, typically between 50 and 60 degrees. In summer, the pit house interior stayed cool. In winter, it stayed significantly warmer than any above-ground structure. By around the year 750, these evolved into kivas, ceremonial underground chambers that retained all the thermal advantages. Kivas were more carefully constructed. 
excavated deeper, often five to six feet down, lined with stone masonry in later periods. Key features included a central fire pit, a ventilator shaft that brought fresh air in at floor level, and an air deflector, a stone or adobe wall positioned between the vent and the fire. This ventilation system was sophisticated. Fresh air entered low, got warmed by the fire, rose up, and exited through the roof opening. Continuous air circulation without losing heat. The ancestral Puebloans understood something fundamental. If you're going to build a structure to handle extreme temperatures, work with the one constant available, the Earth's subsurface temperature, ingenious heating and ventilation systems. Let's look closer at the specific innovations that made these underground systems work. First, central hearth design. In Earth lodges, the fire sat at the exact center of the circular floor plan. Heat radiated equally in all directions. The smoke hole directly above created a natural draft that pulled smoke straight up. Second, smoke hole technology. Many earth lodges had a double layer chimney design that prevented rain and snow from entering while still allowing smoke out. Some longhouses had adjustable flaps on their smoke holes that could be repositioned using poles from inside, controlling draft based on wind direction. Third, air circulation systems. Pit houses and kivas had a dedicated ventilation shaft. Fresh cold air enters low, flows toward the fire where it's heated, rises and exits through the roof opening. This prevents smoke buildup and ensures continuous oxygen for the fire. Fourth, insulated doorways. Earth lodge entrances positioned six to nine feet long meant cold air had distance to travel before reaching the main room. Some lodges had the entrance tunnel slope downward then back up. Cold air being denser would settle in that low point. Fifth, the materials themselves. Buffalo hides when layered trap air between them. That trapped air is an excellent insulator. The earth used in earth lodges was mixed with grass or straw, creating an adobe-like material with thousands of tiny air pockets throughout. The tribes that built these systems didn't have thermodynamics textbooks. They had generations of observation, experimentation, and refinement. A family would notice that when they positioned the fire a certain way, the smoke didn't clear properly, so they'd adjust. Over time, this accumulated knowledge became standardized construction techniques passed down through families. Community winter lifestyle. Winter was a time of intensive indoor activity, not hibernation, activity. In an earth lodge housing multiple families, women did the majority of indoor work, making and repairing clothing, crafting tools and containers, processing food from storage, working on beadwork, quillwork, painting. Men maintained tools and weapons, repaired hunting equipment, and critically passed down knowledge through teaching. Winter was education season. Elders told stories that encoded tribal history, moral lessons, and practical knowledge. Children learned by listening and by doing. The communal nature of these dwellings meant children had multiple adults teaching them. In a longhouse with 20 families, a child might learn a particular skill from the clan's most talented practitioner, not just their parents. Winter ceremonies played important roles. Many tribes held specific rituals during the coldest months. The Mandan had elaborate winter ceremonies that lasted days, involving dancing, singing, storytelling, and gift-giving. These events broke up the monotony and reinforced social bonds. Food preparation was a daily activity. Women would take dried corn from storage, grind it, and cook it into various forms. They'd take dried meat, reconstitute it in soups and stews, combining it with dried vegetables and herbs. The fire was the center of all activity. Light, heat, cooking, and gathering point. Someone had to tend it constantly. Let it die and you'd have to restart it, which was difficult in winter. These winter living spaces weren't silent. They were full of sound. Conversation, laughter, children playing, work sounds. The earth lodge or longhouse became its own world, largely self-sufficient, waiting for spring. The survival philosophy. Here's what all of this comes down to. 
These underground systems represent a fundamentally different approach to dealing with harsh environments. The philosophy was simple, work with what you have, not against what you don't. You don't have petroleum or electricity or steel. Fine. You have earth, wood, grass, animal hides, and human knowledge. Use those. The earth lodge builders didn't try to create structures that ignored the cold. They created structures that used the earth's natural properties to maintain warmth. They didn't try to grow food year-round. They created storage systems that preserved summer's abundance through winter's scarcity. This represents a worldview where nature isn't an enemy to conquer. It's a partner to work with. Notice what's absent from these systems. There's no waste. Every material used had multiple purposes and eventually returned to the earth. Cottonwood posts that rotted after eight years became mulch. The earth that insulated lodges got reused when new lodges were built. The knowledge transfer system was equally important. A Mandan woman teaching her daughter to build an earth lodge wasn't just passing on construction techniques. She was passing on an entire system of thinking about shelter, insulation, heating, and community living. The ancestral Puebloans didn't build pit houses on their first try. They went through generations of iteration. Each generation made small improvements based on what worked and what didn't. This is engineering through cultural evolution. The successful techniques persisted because they worked. The legacy written in Earth. When you stand at a site where Earth lodges once stood, you don't see much. Maybe some circular depressions in the ground. But what you're looking at is evidence of engineering that sustained communities through conditions that killed unprepared people. The Lewis and Clark expedition barely survived their first winter on the plains. They survived largely because the Mandan helped them, showed them how to build adequate shelters, shared food with them. The knowledge embedded in these underground systems represents thousands of years of accumulated expertise. When a Hidatsa woman built an earth lodge, she was using techniques refined over centuries. These systems didn't fail. They were interrupted, forced relocations, government policies discouraging traditional building methods, diseases reducing populations. All of this broke the continuity needed to maintain the knowledge. But it's not completely gone. Some tribes have reconstructed earth lodges at historical sites. The three affiliated tribes built an entire village of earth lodges in North Dakota, the first such construction in over a hundred years. What the Native Americans who built these systems understood is that sophisticated solutions don't require complex technology. They require careful observation, systematic experimentation, and accumulated knowledge passed between generations. The earth lodges, longhouses, pit houses, kivas, and cash pits sustained communities for hundreds, in some cases thousands of years. Not by conquering nature, but by working with it. The underground systems weren't hiding from winter. They were embracing the earth as the solution to winter. And when spring arrived, the communities that emerged from those earth lodges and longhouses emerged intact. Fed, warm, healthy, ready for another cycle. That's not just survival. That's mastery. If you want to explore more ancient engineering and forgotten innovations, subscribe to Ancient Horizons. We're uncovering the genius of civilizations that built solutions we're still learning from today.